Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's spotlight session. Uh, my name is John Vaughn. I'm the CEO of Quest Oracle Community, and today I'm joined by Brian Rose, the, the Director of Digital Transformation at Trillium, who will walk you through how to unlock digital transformation with the spotlight on supply chain management. So Brian has been involved in a numerous uh, successful implementations and upgrades across a wide range of industries and is product certified in all JD Edwards manufacturing applications. So we're lucky to have Brian and Brian, thank you uh, uh, and the Terillium team for presenting this week. And without further ado, I will pass it over to you to uh, start your session. Okay, great. Thank you, John. <clears throat> okay, so hey guys, uh, Brian Rose, once again, the the topic for today or the goal of today is to talk about digital transformation at a high level. Spotlight it specifically on that supply chain area, and that's where my background really lies. <clears throat> when we talk about a quick intro, uh, like John said, my, my title is Director of Digital Transformation here at Terillium. I've been very fortunate to work with um, a lot of both on-prem and cloud applications on the, the technology side, helping them you know, transform specifically uh, inside of their supply chain. So my background is heavy manufacturing, supply chain centric, um, whether it's on the supply, demand planning, SNOP, manufacturing execution, IoT. Um, so, so my uh, ultimate role or goal is to help uh, organizations shift to technologies that'll better enhance their process to automate and to uh, make them more efficient. Uh, I've been in the supply chain industry about 15 years, 10 of them with Terillium. So I've been at Terillium for a long time um, and I've kind of grown throughout the, the different products as I have been here. So real quick from an agenda perspective, um, got a lot to cover today. We got an hour. Um, so what is digital transformation anyway, right? Everyone talks about digital transformation and it's, a, it's the buzzword uh, that everyone speaks to. But really, what does it mean? And, and for some people, it means different things. So I'll kind of give my take on what I think digital transformation is. Uh, what are some of the benefits uh, that are correlated with you taking on a digital transformation? What are the key components when you think about your strategy? Um, what do you want to make sure you include when you're building out uh, your approach to your organizational change? How does that ultimately affect Supply chains. So, what does that look like from a supply chain perspective? Some of the new technologies that are driving that change. Um, we'll also talk about. So, once again, my background is both on-prem and cloud. So, we've done a lot of comparing between on-prem solution to cloud solutions, where they fit, where the value in the cloud is versus what the on-prem does. So, give you a quick kind of visual view of how we normally do that. Uh, Tom, who is on with me, will be talking about the importance of change management. So that when anytime you do a large organizational change, you want to make sure to have that, that person aboard to help you make that change from a, from a high level. And then finally, you know, what is an example of a digital transformation roadmap? How do you get there and what are the, some of the key components to it? So really quick, I'm not going to market you guys to death, but if you don't know Terillium, I want to go through a couple of slides. Um, we've been around for a long time. Uh, we are both a uh, JD Edwards and Oracle Cloud and NetSuite firm. Um, so we are Oracle focused. Um, that is our uh, main driver. We've been around for 27 years. We're uh, based here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Started in 1994 and we've been really kind of doing it ever since. We have a lot of um, full-time employees, and that's one of the key things that I always like to speak to is we don't sub out much of our work. We are W-2 uh, type of organization, which allows us to have a single strategy, and, and a lot of our resources have been here a long time uh, with 16 plus years of experience. And then finally, just as just a, a high-level view, we've helped you know over 700 clients in our 20-something um, years across the U.S. and abroad, and we've really become kind of that trusted advisor. So um, if you do need any help, please feel free to reach out. Enough with the marketing. I know no one comes to these sessions to see that. Um, now let's kind of jump into some of the meat of 
digital transformation. So, you know, like I talked about, what, what is this? And ultimately, in its most basic sense, it's the process of digitization plus digitalization equals digital transformation. Okay. Now, let's break down each of those specifically. So, first, let's talk about digitization. You know, what is that? And ultimately, it's the process of you changing from an analog form to a digital form, which, so an example there, and I'll date myself a little bit. If I'm converting CDs or vinyl records or whatever it is, right, to MP3s or to my iPad or to my iPhone, that's an example of digitization. If I'm taking a shop floor uh, work order, the paperwork, and I'm now loading that into a software system which allows me to get rid of the paperwork that is a great example of digitization it's the conversion or representation of a physical or non-digital to something that is digital and, and by doing this it allows us to kind of extract that data to now we can process it we can transmit it and we can optimize our processes based on it okay so that is the kind of the foundation digitization the next piece is digitalization so um, th this is really the use of digital technologies and taking that digitized data to see how it impacts work um, getting done. So at the end of the day, digitalization can't really occur uh, unless you go down that path of your digitalization. So if we referred back to the example I talked about earlier um, in terms of converting paper documents. Uh, so a digitalization initiative would be me uploading those files to the cloud to transform, to be able to collaborate, and ultimately to report on those different data using different analytical tools to generate different insights, actionable knowledge, and at the end of the day, to create a more efficient process. Okay, so those are the two key pieces when we think of digital transformation. Now, what is digital transformation at the highest level? So I take digitization, I take dig digitalization, and digital transformation is a little bit broader, right? It's me not just applying technology to an existing business. It's really the capacity to rapidly adapt when you have to through the intelligent use of technologies and information. So that digitization and the digitalization. So the, the way that is kind of commonly um, defined, and I'll speak to this very quickly, Digital transformation is the profound and accelerating transformation of business activities, processes, competencies, and models to fully leverage the change and opportunities brought by digital technologies and their impact across society in a strategic and prioritized way. So, so at the highest level, it's the way that I bring together those strategic and continuous missions to create a digital transformation. So that, that to me is kind of what digital transformation means. Now, when we think of the history of digital transformation, uh, the, the buzzword has, has been around for a little while, um, but it's actually been around much longer than most people think. So digitization really started in the 1950s, back when the microchip was invented, which allowed us to move from an analog type of process to more of a digital process. And as the years have come, right from the World Wide Web to, you know, by 2000, half of the uh, Americans having computers or personal computers. This is where that digital re um, revolution really started. So 2010 is when digital transformation projects really began to show some success, some success, and it started to really dominate how business would strategize um, their go forward approach. From a 2020 moving forward, you know, at this time, 40% of all technology spending is going to be going to something around digital transformation, whether it's digitization or you digitizing your um, different technologies with the presence of AI and bots and um, artificial intelligence. Um, the spending is expected to grow at almost a 16% yearly rate. So something that isn't stopping and at the end of the day, it's only gonna progress to a much more um, effective process. So, so why is it important? What are some of the key drivers for people wanting to make these change? So at the highest level, it drives cultural and innovation, preparing the company to anticipate disruption. So COVID is the, is the perfect example of disruption. Uh, every organization that I work with, COVID has become 
an absolute nightmare for their supply chain. And they weren't prepared for it, just like not many people were. But those organizations that took that digital approach and transformed the organization, fortunately, early on in the 2010s, 2015s, they, it was much easier for them to manage the risk, manage the supply chain. And there's certain things you can never manage, but it allowed them to get actionable insights, which drove their process to be much more efficient. This also allowed them to really uh, increase the speed of how they change to those different demands in the market. So we have customers that are across all different um, industries. Some were unbelievably busy, you know, when you think of outdoor equipment, uh, a massive influx of people wanting to get outdoors during COVID. How do you strategize for that? How do you plan for that? By having a digital strategy and having a um, process where your whole supply chain is working in unison, it allows you to be flexible when those significant demands come and hit your process. Uh, that ultimately then opens the door for new business opportunity and revenue streams and enables you to roll out new products and services um, based on that new digital structure. And then finally, you know, it's really a competitive advantage. So when you are competing against the different um, uh, companies in your industry, the people that are moving towards more of a digital footprint, more of a, a, a nimble, agile process, they, uh, they can um, react much faster, giving ultimately the customer a better end experience. So when people were um, polled, these were some of the top benefits when we talked about from adopting a digital model, and most of these will make, uh, make sense. So what are we trying to do with adopting this model? Well, we want to improve our operational efficiency. We want to um, get rid of all the paperwork. We want to get rid of clicks. We want to have the system make recommendations versus me having to look at where's my capacities. So improving that operational efficiency, the throughput on the shop floor, when are machines running at their best capacity, all of those key pieces. Meeting changing customer demands, like I talked about before. Um, customer demands are ever changing and you need to have ways to uh, get that type of information, whether you're grabbing it from a Twitter or a Facebook or you know the, the digital landscape that's where a lot of organizations are starting to look at their demand generation. Say, hey, we, we see people looking at it this way. Let's start to improve it. Um, improving your product quality. So getting feedback from the customer to ultimately improve that product quality. Reducing R&D, introducing new revenue streams. All these are really the top um, six different reasons that people are kind of adopting that digital model. And these are just um, <clears throat> finally just some uh, digital transformation statistics. So um, at this point, digitally transformed organizations are projected to contribute more than half of the GDP by 2023. That's over $53 trillion. Um, also by 2023, you know, the spending on those types of services which allow digital transformation is estimated to be about $2.3 trillion. I mean, these are big numbers and organizations that are taking huge leaps to begin uh, their transformation process. And companies, once again, at the end of the day, have a higher, that have a higher digital maturity, um, reported 45% better revenue growth than the lower maturity companies because they're much more able to um, approach changes in the market, issues at the supplier, issues at the warehouse <clears throat> in a more efficient and digitized and digitalized manner. So what are some of the key components when we think about a digital transformation strategy? Okay, these can be kind of uh, morphed into different options, but these are the six that I feel, you know, you want to make sure to include whenever you are building out that specific strategy. Um, so um, I'll go through each of these kind of individually, but from a high level, you need to have a good strategy and ultimately leadership behind that strategy. You need to make sure your culture and organization is prepared for this type of change. When you are building out that strategy, making sure to include where can I automate, where can I optimize specifically on your technology or internal processes? What type of data am I looking to gather? And, and also, what type of um, insights am I trying to gather from that specific data? What technology will I be leveraging? Is it going to be a, a third party planning tool? Is it going to be my ERP? 
Is it going to be bots? Is it going to be IoT PLCs? What, what does the technology look like? And then finally, what results am I looking for? What can I benchmark myself against as I am going through this transformational journey? Because if you don't have benchmarks and you can't um, tangibly look at where am I gaining value, you, you'll never know if your um, strategy and your, your plan is working as you expect it. <clears throat> so to dive into these each um, a little bit deeper, so an, an effective strategy really, it seems to be obvious, but a lot of time it's, it's a very overlooked component when people build out these roadmaps. Um, you know, a, a basic strategy with fitting technologies, it can help you digitize or even digitalize your business. But the transformation, right, the, the movement um, really requires the correct mindset and the correct guidance, um, which means, right, you need to have just the correct strategy combined with the right leadership. You know, who is going to be driving this specific product? Um, visionary leadership with the correct mindset can lead to a better, smoother, ultimately more cost-effective and time-effective plan to transform your business. Uh, a couple of the key qualities you're going to want to look for from a transformational leader. One is you're going to want to have someone who is purposeful in terms of making changes. They'll be able to answer the question of why are we making this change? What are we going to gain from an organizational perspective? Why are we adding this new technology? What is this technology going to do for this? So they have a, a, a solid purposeful view of why is this change happening? Someone who's forward looking. Someone who doesn't just look at the past or what's happening right now, but has a, a, a clear pulse on what does the future possibly look like um, based, based on our resources, based on the market, based on our strategy. And, and then finally, people who are OK with change, you know, that change is always a hard piece. And Tom is going to talk about this in a little bit. But change in an organization um, is key. And you need to have a leader who is willing to try different technologies, be adaptable, and ultimately change their approach to nurture a culture that embraces change. Organizational or organization and culture. So digital transformation demands more than just, like I said, updating technologies or redesigning products. If an organization fails to align its digital transformation efforts with its internal values, behaviors, it, it really has a knock effect on the organization's culture. Uh, repercussions range from things like slow adoption, um, loss of market competitiveness, competitiveness and, um, and inevitability failure that is going to happen, right? Whereas if, if you set up a culture and a comprehensive and collaborative approach, to shift that culture, to understand and embrace and advance digital technology, that's going to put you in a much more um, advantageous position. Some of the things we need to be or the organization needs to be clear about is emphasizing more action, less planning, right? Let's get in here. Let's let's get and start a process which is going to help us from a technology perspective. Let's not plan something out for two months. So more of an agile type of approach. Also, someone who values collaboration more than the individual effort. So in free digital transformation or, or even the traditional supply chain, it's usually very siloed. There's not a ton of collaboration. If there is, it's very manual, whether it's email or calls. And the organization needs to be willing to work together and collaborate versus just having kind of that individual effort. Process automation and optimization. So, I mean, how many times, I'm, I'm sure people on this call have been in the middle of process and they're like, man, there's, there's got to be, there's got to be an easier way to do this. You know, every organization that I go into has this crutch and it, it involves new, numerous processes, operations, which, you know, can be transformed to make workflows smoother and easier. So by you keeping that process automation in the back of your mind while you're formulating this digital transformation strategy, you know where your pain points are today. And then you make sure to, as you're building out your strategy, apply the different technologies, the different digitizations, the different cultural shifts, the different collaboration options to make it a more automated and optimized process where 
people in the organization aren't having to do as much um, management of all processes. It's more of a manage by exception type of function to where I'm only looking at what's important to me. I'm not looking at every single order that's running through the shop floor. Data and analytics. So, you know, data has taken kind of a center stage when we think of digital transformation because it, it helps us eliminate assumptions and, you know, deal specifically with facts, whether it's AI, machine learning, IoT. You know, these are all helping organizations turn volumes and volumes of data into future ready foundations for a new era which machines will, will only augment kind of what humans uh, decisions are, are doing but at the end of the day in real time they'll be able to make decisions and be much more nimble to where like i said users aren't having to, to worry about the details in certain situations they're they're allowing the system and the data to help drive some of that information Technology, so technology is probably my, my favorite part of the strategy just because I'm, I'm a technology guru at heart, you know, but at the end of the day, identifying fitting technologies is, is one of the most crucial parts, um, whether it's, you know, things inside of your ERP, IoT, machine learning, the mobility, um, the, uh, some of these new technologies need to be embedded in your digital transformation strategy because without them, you're not going to be able to change your, your process in a way that is efficient and gives you the direction that you need. So being clear on that technology implementation, um, it'll help you to do things like smoothly carry out that transformation process, ensure that you invest within your constraints. And then finally, you're, you're overcoming some of the flawed processes that you may have today because of maybe it's old technology or old processes and being a more future ready business for what happens um, moving forward. And then like I talked about results, you, you need to have a way to benchmark yourself from an organizational perspective on how are we doing? How is our digital transformation coming from? Is our, are we aligned with our strategy? Is our data giving us what we're expecting? How is our organization handling this change? But, you know, are, are we, losing people are we gaining people are people excited about this and, and then at the end of the day how does this change the customer's experience so for for a lot of organizations um the customer is obviously the, the most important person to to uh deal with so how, how is this helping them is it re um, reducing lead times is it reducing costs because now we're much more efficient is it giving them information on better dates of when they'll get a product um, is it um, allowing us to grab information from the customer, uh, their feedback, and saying, how can we make our product better? All of those are different uh, types of results that you're going to want to capture as you're building out your overall strategy. Now, how does this affect the supply chain, right? So we've, we've talked at a high level of what is digital transformation, what are some of the strategies or one of the key, some of the key foundations when you're building out your strategy? But, but now, how does that affect your supply chain? So when I think about this, you know, these are some examples of what it looks like today. So depending on your organization, maybe you're manually gathering information across multiple systems, multiple roles, a, a lot of Excel type of pieces. Um, you're not collaborating, like I talked about earlier, you're sending emails, you're calling, you're sending text messages, whatever it is, you're using a SharePoint site. Um, you're doing a lot of that manually today. The uh, what if analysis or scenario creation. So if I want to know what happens to my supply chain, if I if I possibly get an order for 500 units, that's all kind of done manually today. It's not sensing um, what may happen based on previous history and then building out that what if uh, scenario automatically. And then finally, you know, cadence-based planning and decision-making. So a lot of places that I go into, you know, every morning at nine o'clock, they're looking at their messages because they know MRP ran. And then every afternoon at one o'clock, they're doing the same exact thing. It's very cadence-driven. Um, this is really kind of what the digitalization transformation helps with, right? We have real-time connections. We're gathering data, whether it's from a machine directly, from an API directly, um, 
to where I don't have to manually gather any of that information. I'm now collaborating with scenarios across everyone in the organization. So I can put a specific, um, maybe something comes up, hey, machine's down, how do I deal with it? And you're doing collaboration with the planners, the people on the floor, the maintenance department to help determine what is our approach and doing that all in a systematic process. Automating the what if simulations. So having it look at demand and sensing and saying, hey, based on what we've seen in the market and where the orders have gone, this is probably what's gonna happen. So let's see what happens to our supply chain if that is actually the case. And then finally, you know, event-driven planning and decision-making. So more real-time event-driven planning and decision-making that can be done um, on a all-day type of continued process. I really like this visual view of you know, what the traditional supply chain model was or is and what more of an integrated supply chain ecosystem is. So you, you know, if you look on the left side, it, it's really a plan and react, right? So I plan from the supplier, I bring in products. I then go to production, I have to plan production. I then go to distribution, I need to plan distribution, customer output. And there, there's a lot of times not much um, intermingling between some of those, right? Um, so I, I may not know exactly where a truck is when I ship it out of the distribution facility unless I go into UPS or some 3PL site. Um, I may not know how my production is doing. I may not know how my supplier's capacity is. It's a very um, forward looking, you know, moving from the supplier up to customer. Whereas a integrated supply chain, it's really a way to share all that information in a centralized way. So me gathering things like my customers, or sorry, my suppliers' capacities, how many can they kick out? Are they having quality issues? If I can grab data from my IoT machines on the production site, uh, in the distribution area, if I have machines that are out doing my restocking or my receiving of products. All of that is brought into a singular spot, which allows me to be much more nimble versus having to bounce around into all these different areas. Um, so, I mean, the, the traditional supply chain is usually largely static and it's based on rules, uh, whether it's historical, where you know the fully digital supply chain is, is a real time living and breathing ecosystem which is dynamic and allows us to really adopt to different changes in circumstances. So I, 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 I love this visual view, um, it's from McKinsey, but it gives a, a nice view of that digital um, ecosystem, right? That digitally transformed ecosystem in a, in a more uh, visual way, right? Whether it's gathering information from the factory to make sure that I have capacity knowing the exact location of a shipment that I have. So I can tell a customer or maybe the incoming warehouse, hey, where is a truck? Um, the, the ability to do things like predictive shipping, if I need to bring in different um, freight, freight brokers to bring trucks in, when will they be ready? Um, grabbing data from a forecasting perspective from like we've talked about earlier, from Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any type of markets where are we, should we be pushing our different products? All of that now is a fully functioning ecosystem with <clears throat> each of the different areas speaking to each other. So th this is a really cool view and it, and it gives kind of a, a high level view of what supply chain 4.0, which at the end of the day, you need to leverage digital transformation to get there. <clears throat> okay, so what are the what are some of the new technologies that are driving this change? Mobile, IoT, AI, cloud. We've talked about a lot of these um, earlier on today. When we think of this from an Oracle Cloud perspective, so we see a ton of organizations looking at Oracle Cloud, whether it's on-prem JD Edwards customers or people that don't run an Oracle product looking at the full stack and saying, hey, how, how can this help us? Now, the, the focus for today, once again, is more on the supply planning side, 
But what you'll notice is all those key technologies I talked about, whether it's AI, machine learning, um, IoT, all of those are incorporated in this fully integrated stack. So I have all of those kind of at my fingertips when utilizing this Oracle cloud solution. So to go into each of these um, kind of individually, uh, we're gonna be talking about mostly, like I said, planning today, what demand planning, supply planning, um, some IoT, and then there is a, a new production scheduling tool, which I think is very neat. Uh, so the Oracle supply planning network, it looks very much like that visual I showed earlier where I'm getting data from uh, my demand management with from IoT type of devices. I'm able to collaborate. I'm going through a full-blown sourcing to sale function in a real-time atmosphere. So instead of me having to wait to know when my supplier's product is going to be at the, at the manufacturing facility, I know once they ship it, or I know once they complete it, if they give us access to their facility, or if they're going in and creating commitments um, inside of the uh, Oracle planning tool to say, hey, we're committing to this date, and they're making the updates on their side to help process that flow much easier from a day-to-day -day perspective. Now, there's really a couple of tiers when we think of supply chain planning. Um, so there's demand planning, there's supply planning, and then there's uh, you know business to business type of planning so you think intercompany or you working with a supplier or you working with a third party contract manufacturer so in demand planning there's there's a couple of key functions that um, we always see organizations find a ton of value out of so one it's that ability to multiple or to manage multiple different demand signals whether it's internal customer market signals and by taking all of those into play and determining the most accurate forecast that you may need to have based on what the orders are you have today <clears throat> and what you have from an inventory perspective and determining, hey, this is something that you should be building. So whether that's you simulating a forecast manually, having the, having the system simulated for you, it can then at the end of the day drive your demand and allow you to determine your forecast accuracy. So if it, if it runs a specific plan and it's inaccurate and it's not uh, matching up, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, all of that is going to be recognizing and helping and learning as it gets new signals. So it's that sensing to, to predict and then ultimately to shape it to help to replenish your demand. Now I create my demand, which is um, either going to be at a sale level or at a forecast level. And then that drives us now into our supply planning cloud. So in supply planning cloud, I can go across all different organizations. So this is multi-facility. Uh, it's constrained or unconstrained. So that's one of the, the benefits we see specifically when we think of JD Edwards customers. So MRP and JD Edwards is an unconstrained MRP. Um, whereas in cloud, you can actually run constrained based plans. So I can look at my capacities, my inventory levels, and it will give me accurate dates of when I can actually create a product. And it will give me that date um, very quickly. Uh, what if analysis? Once again, like I talked about earlier, if I want to be able to put in a, hey, I got an order for 500 units or I may get an order for 500 units, what is that going to do to my supply chain? Am I going to have to overnight a bunch of raw materials? Am I going to run out of capacity on the shop floor? you can run all those different scenarios and the system will generate recommendations based on the issue. So if I have a product, let's say I run out of capacity, but I have the ability to send out to a supplier or a PO for them to make some to where I can now satisfy my demand, but it's in a little bit of a different sense than me having to manufacture it all in-house um, inside of that process. B2B collaboration, uh, this is one of the bigger pieces. So this is me allowing uh, external sources, whether it's suppliers, trading partners, um, to come in and help from a supply chain visibility perspective. So if I'm getting their forecast, if I'm having them commit, this is where I can have them uh, go in from a portal perspective and put in what is their current manufacturing run and say, hey, this is what's going to be completed on this date. Uh, is there quality information that they're feeding over, which helps us to determine, you know, every, you know, out of every 100, we get two bad 
widgets from this supplier. All of that information can be built into this supply chain with this B2B collaboration to where I have full-blown visibility of the whole um, picture versus having a call or email or get someone you know, uh, in a room to talk about it. The Oracle production scheduling, this is actually fairly new to the Oracle Cloud. Um, so this, in the past, you really couldn't do finite scheduling down to the hour, um, but in the, the newer releases, you're now able to do that drag and drop type of scheduling, which is ultimately going to improve your efficiency, optimize things like changeover, minimize downtime, and you know give you the ability to proactively <clears throat> monitor your shop floor. So this is a visual view of what it looks like. So like I said, you can pull up um, different work centers, work orders, resources, see where your capacities are, add downtime, um, and determine where your bottlenecks are. So you can see in this situation, what's the utilization, what's my labor utilization, how many late work orders do I have? So having a finger on the pulse of what's going on, and with things like IoT, I can also have those um, updates, whether it's completions, machines down, all be rolled into this production scheduling tool. And then the final piece is the IoT and machine learning. So uh, grabbing things from a smart manufacturing process, connected assets, connected logistics, if I wanna see where a truck is, how efficient is a specific facility, um, what's my operational efficiency, my in-use time, my downtime. These are all insights that help organizations to better plan what can their throughput be? How can they get products to their customers? Why are they having specific issues where they're always late on their shipments? A lot of those can be built um, or learned by leveraging the IoT and machine learning footprint. So there's a couple of new or models we see a lot of people leverage for um, bringing on new technologies. So the first one is kind of a hybrid or edge model. So if you're leveraging an on-prem solution, whether it's JD Edwards, EBS, PeopleSoft, we see a lot of organizations now looking to augment around the edges with a cloud solution, whether it's something like um, the PLM tool or the ability to do supply planning, demand planning, SNOP. Uh, you know, my background, once again, is JD Edwards. So th those kind of four functions I just talked about, JDE doesn't do a great job in those areas. So we see organizations looking at the supply planning cloud or, or the demand planning cloud to help augment some of that. Now, we also have been seeing a lot of organizations fully transform. So moving from more of the on-premise model to more of the SaaS model, where you're getting the continuous updates, you're getting the continuous improvements. Um, this is obviously a, a longer effort but um, this is also transforming your organization in a much higher way. Now, when we go through and help organizations kind of understand what their options are, um, <clears throat> we like to do some different mapping. So this here is an example of me uh, mapping a, a customer's JD Edwards footprint to the cloud, okay? So up what you see up here, and we've broken it down into some different areas, order cash, fulfillment, manufacturing, uh, procurement, planning, logistics, and financials. And in here is kind of their listing of their footprint of what they use today. Now, if we jump in here, this is a visual of where the cloud in these specific areas has an advantage. So supplier management, supplier portals, um, demand management, supply planning, those are all areas where uh, on-prem like JD Edwards has the ability, but the cloud solution is much more efficient um, and does a much better job. Now, if I jump one more slide, this is an example of products or functions in the cloud that JDE doesn't have, right? So when we think of e-commerce, um, CPQ, global order promising, SNOP, these are all functions sourcing from a procurement perspective. These are all cloud only features and functions. So when you look at this and we think of this from a customer's perspective, when I see this planning, everything is either dark blue or light blue. So that is a great opportunity for them 
if they want to go more of a hybrid approach to look at planning because it's going to give them the most value. Whereas maybe something like fulfillment, there's not as much, you know, it's three of the five or sorry, four of the seven. And let's maybe not take that on. So this is a great visual of how we kind of approach these. Same type of thing when we talk about doing um, requirements mapping, goals mapping. So going through determining what are your requirements from a digital perspective and can the on-prem solution do it? If it can't, can the supply planning cloud solution do it? So we go through a lot of these different exercises to map out where is the best fit um, for each and every organization. So we talked about digital transformation, how it affects the supply chain, what are some strategies around it? What are the technologies people are leveraging? Uh, one of the big pieces to, to any change is organizational change management, OCM. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Tom and let him talk a little bit about the importance of OCM. Hey, Brett. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I will make it quick. I could literally talk about this for days, but I think it's really an important piece to talk about in terms of digital transformation, supply chain, all the stuff that, that Brian was talking about leads back to this piece. If you want to hit the next slide, that'd be great. Um, is that oftentimes we look at it that the biggest wild card you've got in any type of transformation, especially in, in your organizations, is the people. That's the biggest wild part, part. The software, the technology, we got that down, but if we don't get the people, and so you start asking yourself, what is this project? What are we changing? That's your purpose. What are we changing? And then you'll look at why are we changing out of that? And then ultimately, who's going to be changing? Finally, that gives you to be able to propose that question of how much of this purpose, how much of what we're changing, what we're looking to do is going to be achieved if the people don't adopt the change to their daily day to day work or another way of thinking about it is what percentage of that purpose, what percentage of what we're looking to do is this is dependent upon people doing their jobs differently, behaviorally differently. And from that, we get an inventory who has to adopt to the change for this change, this project, this initiative to succeed. And we can start looking at specific change management plans to manage that. So our approach to that is if you hit the next slide, uh, please, is really uh, integrated approach of change management. My background is organizational clinical psychology. I've been doing this for, I got way too much gray hair, I can tell you that. But we've got a really unique approach that we bring, Trillium does, to change management because we've seen this in projects. And the key here is this integrated approach that it's not a bolt on, but when you're looking to make a transformation change in your organization, especially moving to a digital transformation, you have to have all three of those components. You got to have that project and that technology and people, or excuse me, technology and business side. You need to have the proper leadership and sponsorship. Brian talked about that earlier on. And then ultimately, you have to have that ability to get to the end user adoption, to be able to have people absorb and manage, and manage that change going forward with that. If you leave out one of those components, you will see extreme risk to your initiatives being completed on time and on budget, and more importantly, for any type of sustainable value and business ROI out of that, if you'd hit the next slide. So what is change management? It's definitely not a touchy-feely thing that HR does to do kumbaya in any way, shape, or form. It literally is the way of understanding what is that change that's going on at, across your organization, to your people, your customers, your vendors, supporting those things with the drivers of that change, always going back to that and creating very concrete strategies and actions for sustainable adoption of that change. And we have a form, uh, a methodology and a set of tools that work in that that are based upon uh, science, neuropsychology, and, and strong um, organizational change management practices. If you'd hit the next slide, and we do this, and recommend every organization do that from this perspective, that you run change management from four areas. You look at it at the enterprise level, across the whole organization, across the enterprise, because the, the, the change is going to happen across your organization. It has to do that. You're going to be changing culture. Well, I had a CEO once ask me, you know, we're not changing the culture. I said, well, what is the culture of an organization? In essence, it's the amalgamation of the behaviors of the people. 
If you're changing how people behave and operate, you are changing the culture of your organization. We look at the division or department level. So we get down to that departmental division, the location, your DCs, et cetera, because change happens nuanced in different areas in your organization. We also look at the core process teams because they've got to make that change first to be able to create that change, to design it, and then deploy it out to the organization. And ultimately each individual because each receiver needs to be accounted for in a change process. So to be effective in a digital transformation, you have to look at all four of these areas in, in concert with each other as we go. If you'd hit the next slide. Uh, and I know I'm talking really fast here because I, there's so much to go through, but we just got a few minutes. I just want to touch on that, that there are seven key elements of successful change. And those are integrated into, an, uh, and I recommend already integrate that OCM plan into your project plan as a whole so that you create a sustainable model that works long after that. Our model at Trillium is, is that we create, um, a, everything we do is uh, re, uh, scalable and repeatable. So when we walk away off a project with the OCM, the organization has a set of tools, methodologies, and knowledge to manage change going forward. They're change agile. But we look at areas like stakeholder management, addressing each one of those, heat mapping out the organization, an ongoing sense of risk mitigation. So we look at those risks across the, the board that work in, in terms of technology, business, and environmental cultural risks. We address those things up front. Sponsorship and leadership, beyond a doubt, are huge because it cascades down, but we also create a process to cascade change up through the organization. Looking at change impact management, that's huge. Looking at not just the impacts of the change, what are those secondary tertiary impacts to your employees, your customers, your vendors? Because there's a, you have to manage those changes. Uh, communication, I don't even have to talk about that because that's the key component to change is rewiring people's brains, and that's what we do. Uh, and then we look at our training and onboarding and, and deployment as a sustainable method. It's not just about clicking keys. That's not what you want. You want to create a process where you're onboarding employees. You're not training them on the new technology or processes. You're onboarding them to that. And then they onboard your new employees that come to acquire a new company that are onboarding. And that becomes your sustainable model. If you'd hit the next slide, Brian, appreciate that. I just chose, this is an eyesore, but I wanted you to kind of, this is a basic methodology if you look at it and it gives you a sense of some of those comprehensive activities or tasks that happen across the, the uh, timeline of a project. And we won't go into detail with those, but you can see that it runs all the way through really going from getting people to understand why we're going through that change, absorbing that and moving to this place where they own that change and that becomes integrated in your organization. And it's and people aren't doing workarounds at the end of, when you go live on it. Remember, this is about relationships and rules. Uh, if people don't have a relationship with those rules, it leads to active or passive rebellion. If they have a relationship with why they're going there, who's telling them what to go there and what they have to do, you're gonna find resistance. If you hit the next slide, because I wanna save time for a Q&A uh, off that is ultimately when you look at digital transformation, it's this piece. A lot of organizations stop at installation. Installation's about installing a new system, a new process. Get it up, get it running. And you have to ask yourself, are we, in, are we looking for installation or realization? Realization of transformation of new business oper opportunities, new ways of running the organization, of our employees interacting, of growth, et cetera. If you're looking for a true business transformation, you have to go beyond installation to realization. And that's a lot of what Brian was talking about. And that's what we integrate with the OCM. And you can see, I kind of put out kind of the roles and the key players. A lot of those blend over, but you can see that pulls back in the sustainability around this whole area of the organization owning it, that it becomes the solution of all, oftentimes then, ends up becoming, it becomes your solution, continues to be that. It doesn't become the problem later on. And that's a big piece, that that realization, that's your transformation piece on that. Brian, I'll throw it back to you. Great, thank you, Tom. So guys, just kind of wrap it up. Um, I know we've got about 10 minutes left. So what does that 
transformation roadmap look like um, from a high level? How do you approach it? Um, these are some of the key steps we normally see organizations take. So the first thing is you want to do an assessment. You want to understand what is your current state? What are your current problems? Why are we looking to make this type of transformation? Uh, what comes out of that assessment is a listing of opportunities. Where can we uh, take this specific problem? Like I said, whether it's process related, technology related, people related, culture related, how, how can we um, create new um, opportunities to make that, make that better? Um, which then drives you to create some business cases. Why and what's, what value are we going to get out of making this change? So taking that opportunity, determining what value are you going to get from that? Are you going to reduce cycle time on, on jobs? Are you going to increase customer satisfaction? Are you going to, you know, allow the uh, ability for planners to have more visibility of everything that's happening on the shop floor? What, what is that business case? Uh, from there, you need to get commitment. You know, and when we think of that, we, we need to have commitment from the strategic level, right? One of those key foundations we talked about earlier on is making sure that you have those drive um, change managers on board and committed to the direction. Uh, once you've made that commitment, you then start to scale and implement, you start to say, hey, let's let's approach um, these specific opportunities. You know, I don't recommend doing a huge big bang. It's continuous improvement. So you start with the um, the opportunities that are going to bring the biggest bang for your buck up front. And then you create kind of an agile flow where you have your backlog. What type of transformations do you want to do? What type of organizational changes do you want to do? And then you um, prioritize what you want to approach first. And then finally, the review and recycle. So this is looking at that backlog, reprioritizing, understanding what worked, what didn't work with our original um, rollout of this transformation and making tweaks. So that's kind of how we approach the transformation roadmap. Now, if there is um, the want or need from anyone this call to get that assessment, please feel free to reach out. We do these digital transformation assessments all the time. Um, we can help determine some of the opportunities um, and some of the ways that you can ultimately get there. Um, and then finally, uh, there is another session um, that Terrellium is doing, Cam Copper, um, actually in, in a little bit which he's going to be comparing J.D. Edwards to cloud, specifically on the procurement side. And we also have an innovation um, in manufacturing four-part series coming up in November, which I'll be leading. It's going to be going through kind of the four key cogs of the supply chain process, supply planning, demand planning, manufacturing execution, um, IoT, and then PLM. So all we're going to dive into those different products um, at a much deeper level um, inside, of, inside of those. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions or you'd like to know more about uh, the approach, how we take it, please feel free to reach out to me directly at brose at terrillium.com um, or through the, the, the Pathfinder email. So thank you again. Have a good rest of your day, and uh, we'll be talking to you sometime later on.